I weighed 185 pounds in my early 20s. I was on birth control, leading all the way up until the cancer and went through medical school. My mom was sick. I was a concierge medical doctor in Miami, working weekends, working holidays. You compound that over days and days. I decided I was gonna get a trainer and I couldn't keep up for very, very basic level things with a trainer. Dr. Jacqueline Tolentino, board certified family physician with a holistic approach to practicing medicine. When you understand more about disease states, why people get sick. You look at the evolution of how they get sick. There is a lot more to lifestyle. And so instead of it just being, you have this disease, I want you to take this medication. I wanted to learn how to unravel the why this person is sick to begin with, the world of functional and holistic medicine. Because the entire basis and the foundation is about root cause. Gut health and inflammation. Everyone has gut issues now. Are we getting enough fiber, eating the nutritious foods? Are we choosing the processed foods with a lot of seed oils that are very inflammatory? for our bodies. I'd love for you to talk about the effects of birth control because I also think that a lot of these women, they're on it for so long, for years, and they've just been told to be put on it and they've never really questioned it. So we love to drink coffee first thing in the morning <laughs> on an empty stomach, no breakfast, and they just wait till lunch. The downsides of that. <laughs> oh boy. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Happy Hour. Today, I have a very special guest, which is the incomparable Dr. Jacqueline Tolentino. And actually, fun fact, you're going to be my doctor very soon, starting <laughs> late November. So right now, it's early November. You are the senior doctor at Parsley Health, which is the holistic health clinic that I go through. And when I was relaunching this podcast, I was like, I want more people in the health, wellness, functional medicine space which is something I'm very passionate about as like a patient yeah. and so to to have um expert on the podcast because all of my friends know that I love spewing health but sometimes they're like mm, okay well it goes in one year goes out one year I was like okay I'm gonna bring a doctor on the pod <laughs> and <laughs> it's gonna be more credible but today my guest here today is Dr. Jacqueline Tolentino who is a board certified family physician with a holistic approach to practicing medicine you specialize in hormone wellness, fertility optimization, and immune health. You have a strong commitment to treating the whole person and not just the collective of symptoms. You also have a deep passion for using nutrition as a powerful way to prevent disease. As a breast cancer survivor who has gone through our very tricky US medicine system, you're committed to creating opportunities for your patients to receive the most empowered and informed care they can. This is your 16th podcast, I believe, but your very first in-person podcast, which I'm very yes. honored. I've been at Parsley for over a year now. I just renewed my membership. And prior to recording, you were asking me how I started my journey at Parsley. And I tell a lot of my friends to go through Parsley as well, especially a lot of my girly, girly friends. Mm -hmm. I, I had a couple of symptoms and I just didn't know how to explain it. And I feel like traditional medicine wasn't able to explain it as well. And I remember discovering Parsley in 2021. Mm -hmm. And I just found it online because I was feeling really frustrated. I was going through like unexplained weight gain I was like everyone keeps telling me just exercise more eat less exercise more eat less yeah. and then it just, it just didn't sit well with me and then as time progressed you know I got more symptoms I got cystic acne and then I got fatigue I get a lot of like gassiness and yeah. it got to a point where I was like okay I just have to I little I have to figure this out myself because I'm going to be the biggest advocate of myself you know, and my body. And <laughs> if no one's gonna listen to me, I'll just take action myself. And so that's when I chose Parsley. And I was like, okay, this, this place has been on my radar for honestly over a year, but it wasn't until like when things got to get worse, when things got worse, I started to realize that like, okay, I gotta take action now. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad that I did because I'm still in my twenties. And I think a lot of women, especially they might even wait until their forties until they get something checked out. And that to me, I was like, I don't want that to happen. To or me. later or later yeah. exactly so that's why i'm at parsley i've been there for over a year and um i was working with the amazing dr bentley it kind of coincided with when i was about to renew my membership that she went on maternity leave and i was like oh my gosh dr bentley don't leave me <laughs> and but then she was like okay i'm gonna leave you in proper hands i i'm gonna have three recommendations for you dr stevie dr zap and dr tolentino and i did my research on all three and i was like i feel like dr tolentino and i would really <laughs> vibe and so initially i don't think you were available at the time but then mm -hmm. when i when i sent you a dm to come on the show and said that oh i initially wanted you to be my doctor you said 
oh, I actually have available starting this time. And I was like, oh my gosh, no way. So that makes me very happy. Very I'm glad. Happy. That yeah. means the stars aligned. The stars did align. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm very grateful that you're here. Like it's been, you know, a long time coming that I wanted, you know, a wellness expert on the podcast. And I think in this age, you know, we're all listening about functional medicine, holistic wellness. And I think a lot of my listeners are pretty uh, foreign to that concept. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to preface the makeup of my listeners. So most of my listeners, like I said, are women. I would categorize my listeners into two categories. So category A would be people who grew up in the traditional Western medicine sphere. You know, they pop in painkillers. They eat prescribed medication for a very long time or birth control for a very long time. Yeah. And or B, category B, which is kind of a silly category, but I think a lot of my specifically Asian audiences will resonate. It's people like us who grew up in Asia for most of our lives and we're just told when we're sick, just drink hot water. So that's like how I feel like a lot of people view health. It's either mm -hmm. like medication, 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 or it's nothing bad, just drink hot water and then you'll be fine, walk it off. Yeah. So I'd love for you to explain what functional health is and why you choose to be in this practice. Yeah, it's um, a longer story, but we have time. Mm -hmm. So I'll share it with you how I figured out that this is part of what I needed. I'm a board certified family doctor. Mm -hmm. And in my early 30s, I ended up with breast cancer. And that's a whole nother story. But breast cancer in your early 30s at a time when you're supposed to be in the prime and from a career standpoint, I was hustling and working really hard, overworking. I just realized that for myself, if I wanted to change the outcome of what the rest of my life was going to look like, I needed to do something different with my body, with mm -hmm. my health, the way that I looked at it, the doctors that I saw, the village that I surrounded myself with, including a community, friends and family, the kind of support that I needed. And for me, when I went through that journey, breast cancer it's an incredible journey and I'm still on it, you know, mm -hmm. like as being somebody who is seven years out, that journey itself was the crucial point for me to make a better decision about what I wanted to do with my body and my health for my future so that I could prevent this from ever happening again. Yeah. When I went to see the oncologist, one of the very last times when I was still living in Miami, she said, Jacqueline, we're done. We've got the cancer. You know, you've had a double mastectomy. You went through hormone suppressive medications to, to kind of help support your treatment. You were on uh, all sorts of stuff, but it's over. Mm -hmm. So now you can go back to living your life the way that you lived it before you, before you got diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And that hit me really hard because if you go back to living your life the way that you lived it before you got sick, then that's the same type of sickness that's going to plague you five years from now, 10 years from now, and you're going to get sick again. And when you don't have breasts, cancer spreads. Mm -hmm. And then the idea of metastatic cancer being in your brain, your lungs, being in your liver, those risks are real. And so for me, I was like, I need to prevent these kinds of things from happening. So I can't go back to living that life. Yeah, That was the same life that got me sick. So I had to rewind and really process everything that I was going through from that experience. How was I living? How was I eating? Was I exercising? What kind of sleep was I getting? How stressed out was I? How my stress levels were here? Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was like the crucial point to say, I have to do something different because if I don't, I'm not going to have the kind of outcome that I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, when you're a doctor in the traditional space, you're right. There is a lot of, you learn how to diagnose conditions, you learn how to treat with medications, and there isn't a lot of opportunity in the learning for lifestyle. Exactly. Right? Especially nutrition. We hear that all the time. Even now, people that are going through medical school programs, there is still less emphasis on some of these lifestyle things. So when I was digging and looking for jobs and looking for opportunities to learn more about my body, I kind of like leaned more towards what else is out there for mm -hmm. me to learn about. Then you get away from a lot of the webinars and a lot of continuing medical education that is just focused on prescribing this med or taking this, you know? And you learn that when you understand more about disease states and you understand more about why people get sick and you look at the evolution of how they get sick, that there is a lot more to lifestyle. There's a lot more to sleep and stress and movement and nutrition and how you eat and where you grew up and how you survived all these things, traumatic issues and things that we've all experienced that kind of holistically sums up 
where somebody is in their life journey at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so instead of it just being, you come to see the doctor and let me just tell you, okay, you have this disease. I want you to take this medication. I wanted to learn how to unravel that, unravel the why this person is sick to begin with. Yeah. And when you learn about that, that's when you kind of like veer a little bit more towards the world of functional and holistic medicine, because the entire basis and the foundation is about root cause. Mm -hmm. Why are people sick? What's creating this? And how can we support all of the different things that are creating the sickness to kind of like help them with prevention? Yeah. When you were talking about your life before and how mm -hmm. it's led up to the degrading of health, um, could you paint a picture of what that hustle culture life was like in the For past? Me. Because I think a lot of us were in our 20s, even our early 30s as well. It's like everyone is hustling. They want to be successful. They want to get somewhere. So what yeah. was that life like for you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was not a pretty picture. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I say that looking back and I feel like I can say that now because I see how it's kind of evolved. But at that time, we're talking like, remember that when the time that somebody diagnoses a cancer, what they say is that by the time you can feel a mass or palpate a mass or is in breast cancer for a woman, usually the cancer starts with one single cell that went rogue. And that, of course, snowballs into a mass itself within five to 10 years prior. Mm. So if we're talking about 32, 33 year old Jacqueline, then 10 years earlier than that, that's the entire like life experience that you're looking at for mm -hmm. that evolution of this individual when things started to snowball right underneath my nose and not knowing it. Yeah. And, and so now we're going back to like, you know, 23, mm -hmm. right? I weighed 185 pounds mm -hmm. at one point in my early 20s. I was on birth control. Mm -hmm. for many years, leading all the way up until the cancer. And then at that point, I stopped, of course. I went through stress, went through medical school, went through all sorts of traumas. My mom was sick. I went home to help her during part of medical school with her breast cancer. Mm -hmm. That was her second breast cancer. There were so many things that were happening. And right at the time of when I got sick, when I talk about hustle culture, I was a concierge medical doctor in Miami in my early 30s, working weekends, working holidays, working around the clock, seeing 20, 25, 30 yeah. people a day in the office. And you compound that over days and days yeah. in a practice. I mean, that really weighs on you. Think of all the decisions and things that are being made when you're seeing 20 to 30 people a day, five days a week, and mm -hmm. then you're still working on the weekends. So I was really burned out. I was really overwhelmed. My body was stressed out. It's hard to work in that environment and still feel like you can take care of yourself, you know, to kind of like be working as much as I was, pushing myself to those limits and feel like you'll have time to eat at the right times and get eight hours of sleep and exercise the way that I needed to and focus on my stress. That just didn't happen at that time in my life. And that was a crucial time for me because that was also the time where right from underneath, you know, your world changes, you decide, okay, obviously my body was screaming and I didn't even realize it. The biggest factor that right ha that happened right at that hustle point was I decided I was going to get a trainer and I got a trainer and I couldn't keep up for very, very basic level things with a trainer. Mm, such as? She had me doing certain kinds of drills, mm -hmm. different station drills, like w when we were at the gym. And then at the end of the workouts, I was exhausted beyond belief. Yeah. So tired. I always chalked it up to, yeah, but you're hustling at work. You know, you're working 50 hours, 60 hours. You're seeing all these patients. Of course, Jacqueline, of course you're going to be tired and get sick. You know, of course you're not feeling well. Yeah, maybe you catch a cold because you're overworking, because you're not letting yourself rest. But when I couldn't keep up with basic workouts, and of course the trainer was like, yeah, these are some of the more like lower level advanced, lower level beginner workouts, not the advanced. Then I was like, hmm, this is really strange. That was like one to two weeks before we were playing on the beach with a dog. Charles hit my breast underneath because he mm -hmm. was tickling me and we were like mm -hmm. playing around. And he's the one that found the cancer, not me. Mm -hmm. And so once he palpated and felt something, then he's like, I think I felt something when I nudged you. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there I was feeling it myself. and like, huh, that's really strange. And then from there, you kind of go through everything. Every single test, ultrasound, mammogram, biopsy, 
you know, all the scans, and then you get that diagnosis and it changes your life forever. Yeah. So that hustle of like not taking care of myself on every level that I've now learned how to do, it wasn't, it didn't exist. Yeah. Right. And this is for the 10 years prior. Mm -hmm. We're talking like early 20s up until that diagnosis. Yeah, that's so true. That's why I, I completely, you know, vouch for people, especially women in their 20s, to take charge of their their health, their hormone health. And this is what I'm experiencing as I'm in my 20s. People are like, you're still young. It's not that big of a deal. And you're plagued with a lot of like doubt. And you're like, oh, am I just being too dramatic? Like, I don't want to be a dramatic person, but I'm receiving all these symptoms. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like all of this adds up over time until one day it's I don't know, it's too late or you find something that you don't want to find and, yes. you know, you have to face the repercussions. And yes. so I, I talk about on the show how like I have PCOS and mm -hmm. most doctors are like, oh, like, like we don't know how it's been caused. It just happens. And I do feel like it's like, you know, over time, like compounded time, your habits and everything, like it, it could just cause, you know, a certain like chronic disorder such as that. And I think like looking back at, my last year of college, I feel like that definitely put like a dampener on my health because I was a I was a COVID college kid and I was doing my last year in Taipei. So I was in a flip time zone. So I do classes from 1 a.m. to 8 a.m., sometimes even 9 a.m. when I was like doing when, when I was being a remote intern and I would do that consistently. Mm -hmm. And then after that, because I was staying at home at my parents all day and I didn't have a lot of my classmates next to me, I was like, I need to get out of the house. And so I would go to the gym and at the time my parents were so gracious and they put me up with a trainer because they're like Melissa needs to get out of the house she's so sad indoors all the time like mm. taking classes until the sun comes up like literally her zoom classmates see the sun come up from behind her and she's like working on her theses I was a double major mm -hmm. and I was interning and after like a long day of classes I might take like a little nap I'd wake up eat like a very late breakfast and then I would go to a nearby gym and get a trainer session and get like a 60 minute high intensity workout in yeah and I was like looking back I'm like oh my gosh that was like so much stress yeah <laughs> that probably added <laughs> up and and I thought I was doing everything right I was like as long as I'm exercising like I'll be good right but I was putting all this unnecessary stress on myself and I remember like the first trainer session I had, it was like the first intense workout I had like after COVID. In COVID, we were doing like these indoor mat workouts. They were not that challenging for me. And when I took that first class, I grew up as an athlete, but I was winded. Like I also couldn't keep up with like cardio moves that I thought was my strong suit until I couldn't finish the workout and the trainer had to open a window. And so I was like <sighs> breathing through the window. I was like, yeah. this is so hard. Um, <laughs> Yeah, just like looking back, I was doing so many things wrong, but I thought I was doing everything right, you know, yeah. to try to like reverse some of the habits that I was doing. I was like, if I could just exercise, like that'll just deal with everything. And I yeah. feel like that's how traditional medicine, you know, deals with too, you know, that differs from functional medicine where you says it's really about the whole, like a whole holistic body approach. And when people think of um, holistic medicine, I think when people hear the word holistic, I think it could so... so some doubt or skepticism i feel like mm -hmm. because people are more accustomed to going through traditional medicine that they're like oh functional holistic medicine seems a little like woo woo to me yeah um, but i do like want to also like give you the floor to explain the extensive training that you receive to yeah. become a functional medicine doctor yeah um i think that word holistic is loaded it's a yeah. loaded word and it's also up to interpretation by our experiences for a lot of people. And then of course, word of mouth gets passed and passed. But when I think of holistic medicine, it's never been one or the other. Mm -hmm. It's always been that holistic medicine encompasses all of the tools that are available to an individual to support their health and well-being. That means there are times where prescription medication is part of the solution. Yes. There are times where it is not, where we're focused on supplements and herbs and specific nutrients and targeted things. There are times when sleep and how much and how well and what time of night somebody is sleeping is absolutely crucial. Uh, there are times where how they're exercising, like in your case, you know, for a body that was already stressed out, mm -hmm. adding more fuel to the fire with something that was so high intensity was likely not as beneficial as we would want it to be. 
right? Maybe we needed a bit more balance of trying a few different things. Holistic medicine is using many tools. And what is the culmination of all those different tools? And of course, all of the different body systems that need to, that need support. It's never been traditional versus, you know, yeah, one side okay. versus the other. Mm-hmm. There are going to be times where prescriptions do play a role, but there's absolutely a time for us to understand why first lay down that basic foundation of sleep and stress and movement and nutrition, and then focus on what are other resources that people have. Maybe they're gonna be drawing from Eastern medicine. Maybe they really resonate well with the philosophies of Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. Maybe they wanna implement some of those strategies. And that's where you kind of get into integrative medicine, where you're integrating Eastern medicine into some of these traditional concepts. So functional medicine is root cause. Help me understand why this is occurring. But it also encompasses using holistic tools, meaning every tool that's available to somebody in their toolbox to kind of help to support how well this person can heal, how well can this person thrive, what is their well-being like, and what are your goals, right? I think what, what I struggle with for a lot of women who are experiencing PCOS is they've been through many, many, many doctors Mm -hmm. who, like in your case, were like, yeah, we don't know. We just, we have no idea. Let me put you on birth control. Yes. That's Let me, happens. you know, we don't, but we do know that birth control can help mitigate the symptoms. Yes. So how does it exactly do that? Well, when a woman is put on birth control, it calms down the way that their brain is naturally signal, signaling their ovaries. The way that the brain is signaling down the ovaries to have a once monthly menstrual cycle. Yeah. Instead, it quiets that. So it cuts off that way that the brain is communicating the ovaries and birth control is allowing small amounts of hormones into your body to kind of like trick your body into thinking that it doesn't need to communicate down there. Mm -hmm. When it does that, then all of these symptoms that women experience with PCOS, a lot of times they do go down. This is a Band-Aid though. Yes. Because the minute that you take that person off of birth control, then their brain is like, oh, whoa, what's going on now? Mm -hmm. And it starts to then reestablish some of those communication signals. I think when women are trying to decide, is this the right solution for me? That's a very, very personal choice. What's going on in my life right now? Do I know the pros and cons? Are there risks? And maybe if not, are there risks that are gonna happen right now, but are there long-term risks? Yeah. What happens five or 10 years down the road when you know, like maybe I don't wanna be on this medicine for that long? So there's a lot of things that people need to talk to their doctor about before they start medications and know that that was just one tool in that toolbox. Yeah, that means yep. that there are other ways that could be supportive for a woman who's experiencing PCOS that don't involve the medication. And maybe that's not the first go. Like we don't have to start there. And many doctors will start there. Mhm. This kind of brings up a a memory of when I went to the your standard gynecologist and it was when I was already starting at Parsley Health, but I just really wanted like an official diagnosis because I felt like I had PCOS. I just, I just felt like I I had these symptoms, but I was like, okay, I have to get my blood checked. And so Hmm. I went back home to Taipei. So my mom and I, we went to the gynecologist and this guy, this doctor was actually the doctor that delivered me as a baby when my mom was pregnant. Uh And so, however, he's been jaded. Like I can tell that man is tired (laughs) and he's more grumpy now. And my mom could tell that too, because Mm. you know, like I was delivered 24 years ago Mm -hmm. and, um, he was obviously a different man back then. But Mm -hmm. when I visited, when we visited him and I was telling like, Oh, I have, you know, these issues and I feel like I would like a sonogram. And that's when it was confirmed that, you know, I had, you know, PCOS with some lab work as well. But then I was, you know, once again, put on birth control immediately and then put on these, this medication for my blood sugar. Mm -hmm. I remember I was like, I don't want to go on birth control because deep in my, deep in my mind and my mom too, we were very adamant on like, we don't really know what this is going to do to us long term, specifically to me. And so I just, in my gut knew that I was, I didn't feel comfortable taking it. So I, I didn't take it, but I did take the the glucose pills. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I realized that my appetite was completely suppressed. Yeah. And however, I would suddenly have the urge to go to the bathroom, everything would come out and I would be like shaking with hunger. And I was like, mm. oh my gosh, like what kind of medication is this? And so yeah. I went back to the same gynecologist and I was telling them about this feeling that I was having. And the nurse was like, oh, but that way you can lose weight. I was like, 
oh my god what (laughs) and yeah and i got you know my lab results back that's why i went back and it was confirmed that i had pcos and i had to ask him like is is this pcos and then he was like oh yeah it is i was like you could have told me and i kept asking certain questions you know because your time with the doctor is limited, but very valuable. And sometimes I heard in a podcast, he said that you only get 15 minutes a year with this doctor. Yeah. So I was like, I got to ask questions. And then he was like, it's just the way it is. And I'm like, okay. So my mom and I left pretty, you know, hopeless, but I was able to bring the lab results, bring it back to my parsley doctor. And we're able yeah. to work with that through supplementation, lifestyle changes, habits mm-hmm. um, that have helped, but it's still quite a long journey. Yeah. But yeah, that was yeah. like quite my my experience going to the doctor. That's a really, I mean, I'm sorry you had to experience that mm-hmm. because that's frustrating yeah. to hear um, as, a, as a fellow clinician that you kind of just felt a little bit dismissed, mm-hmm. you know? Um, from a symptom standpoint, I think a lot of women feel that. Yeah. Where... They feel like the doctor doesn't have time for them, that they're not really listening, that they'll easily get irritated or frustrated when you ask a question or two. And as a patient, you're like, can I ask a question? You almost feel like you have to ask if you can ask a question Mm -hmm. because they might not have the time to answer you or they don't have the capabilities of like really laying out on the table, like what exactly is happening here? What we know with PCOS is that at the root of it, it's inflammatory. Yes. So there is a level of chronic inflammation. And I mean, think about cysts themselves. Cysts are fluid-filled sacs that can develop. And so fluid-filled sacs, inflammation, Mm -hmm. right? And we also know that there are hormonal imbalances that are involved with PCOS. So if the insulin resistance is also contributing to the testosterone levels and those androgen levels rising, 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 that is a downstream effect to other hormones, including your sex hormones, including why the period cycles are not always regular or there will be spotting or there will be like, you know, some skipping a cycle here and there or things like that. So hormonal imbalances, inflammation, downstream effects from hormones where one is off and that affects the others. That's kind of what happens. Now, is there a genetic component? Is there a possibility of something that we don't know yet? Of course Mm -hmm. there is. But at the root of it, we know that it's inflammation that's also creating these cysts. Mm -hmm. So from a lifestyle perspective, can we help somebody work on all of these things to kind of like decrease this inflammatory response, help with their blood sugar regulation, help with other things that may have triggered this inflammatory response? Maybe it's stress. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we focus on the right foods to eat that are going to support the right nutrients that will then let those endocrine glands work the way that they're supposed to? instead of over or under producing hormones. I mean, there's so much more to it than let me put you on birth control and you're going to have a side effect of losing weight, you know? Like, yeah. I yeah. just, um, it's unfortunate the, that so many women have that experience and aren't able to uh, spend time with their doctors to be able to like really understand these details and have the tools that they need to make better changes or make an improvement in wherever they're at for whatever condition it is. And I think that's the goal. That's the goal for me. That's the goal for many doctors, including our whole team at Parsley, is how can we help people understand their bodies to the point where they may not need to focus on different treatments like medications that may have severe side effects. Let's start here first. Let's focus on all of the foundational things from a holistic perspective. And then if it's still decided that we need to go a certain route, whether it's medications or supplements, then we go there. We just don't start there first because that could be detrimental over the long run. So it's best to have like a person be well informed of all of the things that can support their health and then together decide. Mm -hmm. So say you you kind of like tell them all the explanation of here's where we can make some improvements in your lifestyle. Here's where we can make some improvements in supplements, in uh, the foods that you eat. And then if somebody is fully informed and then still chooses to make certain decisions, then so be it. Mm -hmm. But at least they were more informed. And I felt like you didn't get that opportunity to feel informed. Yeah. Well, so we're talking about like hormones right now. And I think for a lot of young people, when they think of hormones, they're like, oh, like the sex hormones. And I feel like that's the only (laughs) hormone that they'll know. So foundationally, what do you think are the primary hormones that we should be focusing on as young adults? Yeah, um, you're right. 
So we always think of the sex hormones. So we always go with estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone that are kind of like come together in that group of sex hormones, Mm -hmm. right? But then outside of that, I think it's important to know about cortisol, the stress hormone. I think it's important to know about melatonin, which does so much more than just sleep. It also focuses on restoration and repair. Um, I also think that the thyroid is important. Separate from that, we've also got blood sugar. So cortisol for stress, opposite that is melatonin that helps to support sleep. Mm. And it does a lot of other things. Then we've got blood sugar hormones. Then we also have like insulin, for example, and leptin. Then we also have the sex hormones and thyroid. Those are the main ones because they work together. If you're not sleeping well and not producing great amounts of melatonin, you're going to wake up feeling groggy, confused, stressed out, fatigued, and brain fogged. Yeah. And if you're feeling groggy, confused, stressed out, fatigued, and brain fog, how well do you think you're going to function Mm -hmm. during the day? Yeah. You know? It's so amazing. It's really, (laughs) everything is so connected. Yes. Because also right now, from blood testing that I've done, thanks to Parsley, um, I've noticed that like my iron or my ferritin levels are, are low and yeah. everyone is deficient in iron nowadays. I feel like I've been hearing about that. <laughs> yeah, everyone's deficient. And so when Dr. Bentley said like, if your iron levels are slow, that makes your thyroid sluggish. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like and my thyroid is lower too. And so really yeah. everything is so connected. Um, yeah. Speaking of nutritional deficiencies or hormonal deficiency imbalances, I meant like, what do you think are the most common deficiencies you see in your patients today? Yeah, I mean, if we're grouping together Uh, say we just group hormones, Mm -hmm. there's always a flux with hormone levels. Yes. And so it's hard to say, like, are there times where it's just deficient because hormones are meant to be rhythmic in nature. Yes. So, for example, cortisol levels are meant to be higher in the morning. And then as you exert yourself throughout the day, that energetic response kind of relaxes to the point where at night those levels are low. Mm -hmm. Opposite for melatonin. Melatonin is low in the morning. And then as you kind of like go through the day, exert yourself, and at the end of the night, once the sun is down and everything is dark, our body is meant to produce this melatonin to help support sleep and restoration and Mm -hmm. and help renew our body and our cells. Mm -hmm. And even hit hit reset button on our hormone systems too. So hormones are rhythmic, and there are times of day where that matters. You know, that kind of is based off of our circadian rhythm and how well our body is aligned with the sun and sleep and so on. When it comes to sex hormones, I'll find that testosterone either being very, very high or very deficient, very common. Yeah, mine was very, very high, and I, yeah. that's why I grew a lot of acne. Yeah, yeah. So I see like those extremes a lot more. Within a woman's menstrual cycle, estrogen and progesterone, again, they have their own rhythm. Mm-hmm. Beginning of the cycle, estrogen is meant to peak at the, you know, for the first two weeks. At the second half of the cycle, progesterone takes center stage and is reaching a higher peak. So again, there's a rhythm between them. Hormones themselves, as your body is producing them, there's also a time of day that hormones are primed to produce them. We always at Parsley like our patients to check their hormone labs in the morning. Yes. Because when you wake up and your body gets natural light outside, the sun hits your eyes, it hits the back of your brain to start hormone function, that happens in the morning. So the time that it's more concentrated even in the blood is going to be the morning time. Morning time is optimal, typically before 10 a.m. Yeah. And that's for all hormones that are being drawn. Yeah. Cortisol hormone is something that I did not really appreciate until recently because I feel like for me, I always stacked the other hormones like progesterone, testosterone, thyroid, estrogen Mm -hmm. I I I always ranked those higher and I was like oh cortisol like I think I can manage my stress pretty well so it's like I don't think it's that big of a deal and I remember when I was facing a lot of fatigue like I'd get nine hours of sleep and I wake up and I'd be like why am I still so tired (laughs) um and I got my cortisol checked and when this doctor said that oh your cortisol levels are very low in the morning I was like wait that's great because we're not supposed to have high cortisol but I didn't know that your cortisol is supposed to be the highest in the morning because that's literally going to wake you up. And so I was like, oh, that's why I'm so tired. Yeah. So I feel like a lot of people will undervalue cortisol yeah. and undervalue the importance of stress management, especially in our 20s. And that's something that I've definitely had to learn the hard way because recently I was also telling, um, fairly recently when I was having my last visit with Dr. Bentley, 
I had gone through a couple of road bumps in life. I was like also overworking a lot. I guess I was just not alert. And I, because of that, I got into a car accident. And mm-hmm. so when I got my blood drawn and, and my cortisol was very high, I was like, okay, Dr. Bentley, I have some explaining to do. So I got into a car accident. Yeah. Um, but stress management is really is so important. And, and I'm so glad you're okay. Yes, I you am know? okay. Yeah. Um, and I know when people who are kind of listening to the conversation of hormone health, maybe this is the first time they're hearing it. They're like, oh my gosh, there's so many hormones and they work together in, in a rhythmic way. Like it feels really overwhelming to them. I mean, how yeah. do you approach someone who wants to optimize their hormone health, but they have no idea where to start. Yeah, I mean, understanding cortisol is a very good place to start because it's something that we all experience when it comes to stress and we can all relate to it, especially in this day and age Mm -hmm. with everything that's going on. So there's like a layer of stress that we're all experiencing. And then on top of that, the internal stresses and things that are going on in our body. But what's important to, to say is when it comes to cortisol, this is such an important hormone that it needs to be there in our body. Our body actually needs stress. Yeah. It doesn't need lots of stress or deliberate stress or excessive stress for long periods of time. Mm-hmm. Because when our body kind of accumulates all of that stress, that's when we run into problems. But like acute stress, if I had a paper cut and then there's and you know, next thing you know it's bleeding, you do want your body's stress response to say, "Oh my gosh, what's going on here? Yes. There's an alarm." Because that's also what supports those mechanisms that are going to support acute healing. Mm -hmm. So I think it's hard. It's hard to be tangible with it because we know that certain aspects of the stress hormones are important and they're necessary. But it's this deliberate, long-term, chronic insult of stress that even our environment and our lifestyle are contributing to. That's the stress that can be a warning sign. And a lot of people might not even notice it or realize it. I sure didn't. Mm-hmm. So I, I definitely learned the hard way. I had that experience and I think cancer for me, that was like a, a huge, huge wake up call mm-hmm. because I had to reevaluate everything, you know, like what was creating so much stress? Stress is inflammation in my body. Inflammation in my body go unchecked. That's when it can start to create some problems, including cancer and so on, chronic disease. Yeah. So from a stress standpoint and from a hormone standpoint, if there's one hormone, that's very important for us to understand. It's what is our relationship to stress like? Yeah. Do we notice things about our body? Am I experiencing a lot of symptoms? Do I notice when I wake up in the morning, I am incredibly exhausted and tired when I just had seven or eight or nine hours of sleep? Mm -hmm. What is my day-to-day like? Do I have the proper stress management tools that I should have to help make sure that my body feels grounded and safe and balanced? And That's where I looked back at that time and I'm like, I didn't feel safe. Mm -mm. I didn't feel grounded. I could barely make it through a workout without the trainer questioning the fact that I couldn't even, you know, do some basic beginner exercises. Mm -hmm. So taking a look at your, your relationship with stress is crucial to understanding it because of this downstream effect that it has on every other body system, every other hormone. And so I think that that one is like higher up on the priority list. Now, interestingly enough, Cortisol has a very intimate relationship with melatonin. How well you sleep is also going to help you understand where those levels should be in the morning. Mm. If your sleep isn't rich and deep, you might not be waking up feeling well rested. And this even goes for people who are like, no, I sleep 10 hours, but I'm still waking up in the morning feeling tired. Yeah. But logically, that shouldn't be the case. If we're sleeping 10 hours, we shouldn't be waking up feeling so so tired. Or maybe it's eight hours or seven, right? Whatever is like that sweet spot. So knowing that there is a relationship between how well your body can produce certain hormones at certain times of day, we also have to check that out too. Mm-hmm. If we're not sleeping well, then the brain is not going to have this really great cascade to all the endocrine glands in your body if we're not sleeping well and waking up and getting natural light. We think it has to be this whole orchestration where it's like, oh no, I have to go outside. It needs to be a walk. The sun needs to be up. It doesn't need to be all that, Mm -hmm. right? Our body can really respond and the way that that light needs to hit our eyes, hit the back of the brain, even if you cracked open a window Uh and you were getting that natural light in and you were sitting down doing a five-minute breath work or a meditation or just listening to two songs on Spotify and you were getting that natural light in, 
that is enough mm. for your body to recognize that it's morning and it's time to wake Melissa's body up yes. by starting these hormonal cascades. So it doesn't have to be a whole orchestration. Uh-huh. You know, if we have more time, wonderful. You can take a walk outside. We can be grounded to the earth. We can focus on, you know, sound therapy from like the neighborhood or whatever the case may be. But it could be something as simple as opening up a window and getting that natural light in. And I think that a lot of people uh, are also under the impression it has to be direct sunlight. And that's not the case. Uh, it can be ambient sunlight as it well? It can be ambient. Uh-huh. It can be as long. It could be rainy. It could be snowy. It uh-huh. could be cloudy. The, the time of day is what matters when you're going outside to wake your body up to get that natural light in the morning. And typically when the sun is 10 degrees above the horizon, mm-hmm. this is when we start to get UVA light. So UVA rays from the spectrum there. And that typically happens about an hour after the sun rise in your location. So here in LA, like about an hour after rising, that's a good time to pop open the window to get that natural light in. Mm, amazing. <laughs> we were talking about you know cortisol and stress just now. And I think this is a great transition to a couple of myths or habits that you know I'd like for for you to debunk or <laughs> explain more. Mm-hmm. So people in our 20s, yeah. we love to drink coffee first thing in the morning <laughs> on an empty stomach. And I'm specifically referring to a lot of my friends who do that. Caffeine first thing in the morning, no breakfast, and they just wait till lunch. Yeah. What are the, the, the downsides of that? <laughs> oh, boy. Um... I'm not their doctor, but I will tell you my opinion. Yes, okay. (laughs) Um, When it comes to caffeine, what's tough is that a lot of us have like a really dynamic relationship with that morning drink. Yeah. Whether it's like preparing it Mm -hmm. or the smell of it or the thought of it, it kind of like evokes something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's hard for a lot of people to be, for a lot of doctors to be like, no caffeine, 100%. But we have to understand, like, is that really part of why somebody is so concentrated on that morning cup? And what effect does that caffeine have on their bodies? If somebody is already really stressed out or super wired already or super stressed already or inflamed already, and then they wake up and they go straight to caffeine, what exactly does that do? It just adds more fuel to the fire. Yes. Sometimes people don't realize it right away. And sometimes people are like, I didn't realize that because of that, I was part of why I'm like anxious at lunchtime mm-hmm. or why I'm fidgety or why I noticed that, that uh, like I'm having some palpitations. Yeah. So on an empty stomach and like by itself, first thing in the morning, not ideal. Does it also spike your blood sugar levels? That's it what does. Too. Yeah. It does. It does spike your blood sugar levels. And then the amount of caffeine can change for how people's bodies respond. There's genetics involved. Yes. Some people will say, like, I have that experience, and somebody else will say, no, I don't have that experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more of the unlucky one. <laughs> yeah. And the half-life of caffeine is pretty significant. It's about five to six hours. Mm-hmm. So if you have 100 milligrams of caffeine in the morning, that means that five to six hours later, say you had that at 8 a.m., at like 2 p.m., 50% of it is still circulating around in your body and is, mm-hmm. has not gotten metabolized yet. Mm. That means that we're talking 2 p.m., And you still have some of that morning caffeine in your body, but then maybe you have like another drink Mm -hmm. or you have another cup and then you just add more and you kind of like continue to add more to the body so that by the time you're going to sleep, your body does not actually get this nice, rich, well-rested sleep because some of that caffeine is in there. Yeah. So it creates this blood sugar response. It is an inflammatory response. It can still create problems. It also depends on how much. Yeah. It also depends on that time of day. It depends on how this person metabolizes it. So it's hard to make a blanket statement about caffeine. Mm-hmm. You know, we have to like look at all of these factors to then decide like how much or is this the right kind or are, are there other opportunities for solutions? Like should I be drinking an adaptogenic drink or maybe I should be making tea or maybe I should switch to green tea which has a little bit less, mm-hmm. you know? So you kind of have to check yourself. Yeah, know thyself <laughs> for sure. And, yeah. and But I always try to make sure that I will always eat something in the morning. And I think like a lot of young people, it's like they don't really eat breakfast. Or when I tell people, it's like, it's so important to eat 
first thing in the morning and a lot of yeah. my friends are like i don't feel hungry in the morning though so like i don't feel the need to eat yeah um, so what are the benefits of like eating you know yeah. a nutrient dense meal first thing in the morning yeah um our hunger cues and the ways that our brain like recognizes when we're hungry or when we're full is there's hormones for that mm -hmm. and those hormones are intimately tied to how well you sleep and how well your body's circadian rhythm is aligned mm -hmm. so for example how hungry or how full you are including when you wake up first thing is dependent on how well and rich those sleeps are, mm -hmm. that sleep is. And then of course, the timing of your meals throughout the day. If you have, for example, a nice rich breakfast that includes proteins and healthy fats, and typically carbohydrates are better um, metabolized in the morning or at lunchtime, less so at night for many people. Again, mm -hmm. there's always exceptions to the rule. Mm -hmm. But I like a morning breakfast because this is also the time when my body is literally starting to rev up the engine. Your brain is waking up, the cortisol levels are starting to reach that higher point in the morning. And so as your body is trying to build up all of that energy to support exertion throughout the day, morning is the best time to get yes. a really nice enriched mm -hmm. meal. It's not the same as let me skip breakfast and start the day with a caffeine that's already raising up the cortisol and spiking things even more. And your body is, is still feeling like there's a sense of alarm because it doesn't have any food. Mm -hmm. Food to fuel you, Yeah. right? So. Of any time of day, the best time to get a nice, rich meal is going to be the morning. Yeah. And the logic there is because the, this is when your body is really trying to wake itself up to start all of the energy to kind of like get everything going and also to reach those peaks in cortisol that are then going to balance itself out throughout the rest of the day. So it makes sense that our body does actually want to eat in the morning, but it also we also need to have a primed body to do that, right? Really restful sleep having meals at the right times. So before we kind of like get into this entirely fasted state where the cortisol levels are already high and our mm -hmm. body's kind of like feeling that alarm, we should nourish it. Yeah. Speaking of just like gut health and inflammation, I think that's just an increasing topic. Like everyone has gut issues now. And there's this, um, yeah. this, this Gen Z or a millennial saying that like, hot girls have IBS. Like everyone has IBS. <laughs> <laughs> and when I got tested uh, for my gut health a few months ago, I realized that I had leaky gut. And so many people have leaky gut syndrome right now. And so, mm. and I think a lot of people kind of just view it as it's just the way that things are without Ugh. really treating it. But it, it really is it's like, wait a minute, we have to look into like, what's wrong with our modern like society that's like allowing us to have increased risk of inflammation or to already have, you know, have an inflamed body um yeah. when you say like inflammation like can you break down like what that is and how that can manifest and how that affects gut health yeah for the gut in particular what's interesting is that remember that stress response that we're talking about yes that actually makes modular like changes into the gut into the whole gut microbiome as well because our nervous system has cells that are part of the nervous system itself so we always think of nervous system as like brain, but of mm -hmm. course there are, there are cells that line the nervous system. It's called the enteric nervous system for inside the colon. Mm. And so when people have what I call nervous belly syndrome, <laughs> they, typically have a, they typically are nervous or anxious and where do we feel it? We feel it in the gut. Yeah. Or you're about to start a presentation, you're like, oh my gosh, I have to go to the bathroom. Yes. I have to, <laughs> I all of a sudden randomly have to go to the bathroom. We feel a lot of these emotional changes with stress, with anxiety, with overwhelm in our digestive tract because mm -hmm. the gut and the brain have this bi-directional pathway where they can communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. It's not just a cutoff where the gut is separate from the brain. Mm -hmm. It's that there are hormones and neurotransmitters that are constantly being communicated from one place to another. And we know that there are nerves involved like the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10, that innervates the entire digestive tract. Mm. So when we're feeling nervous, even though we think it's here, we feel it here. Yeah. That yeah. can explain why a lot of people are also experiencing IBS symptoms, bloating, gas, pain, burping, inflammatory symptoms, because there's also this high prevalence of anxiety and stress yes. that they're also experiencing. And a lot of times it manifests here. Mm -hmm. It's also complicated, though. What about the foods that we're putting in? Are we getting enough fiber? Are we eating the nutritious foods? Are we choosing the processed foods with a lot of seed oils that are very inflammatory for our bodies? Are we making those decisions 
or the healthier decisions that are going to help to support how nourished our digestive tract feels and all the different bacteria that live there. Yeah. Because and how we eat is important too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And the timing. Mm-hmm. Right? We talked about like morning, we should be eating breakfast, we shouldn't be skipping it. You know, we should at least talk to somebody if that's the case and we're noticing symptoms. So it's very much a conversation and a dialogue that people should be having with their doctors, especially if they're noticing patterns. I'm experiencing these symptoms or I'm having excessive bloating and I'm trying to understand why. People who are, once again, in our young 20s, when I said like how we eat too, it's like we always love to eat in front of our computers for dinner. (laughs) And like I'm such a culprit of that too. It's like, boom, made a dinner. Let's pop up Netflix and eat in front of my desk. Yeah. Um, And the intention behind eating food has been lost in our generation that we just Mm. see it as a way to fuel yourself. But it's like, it's, there's more because, you know, sometimes like gut health, it's not just here. It also starts with like how you chew your food as well. hundred percent. And like, I, I'm, I'm like a chronic inhaler of food. And so like, it's like literally working at parsley, like being at parsley, I've literally been reminded. It's like, Melissa, like eat slower, chew slower. And I was like, wait, yeah. that's actually so important because that makes me rest and digest, which not a lot yeah. of people really focus on. Yeah, I get bloating is like one of the number one symptoms yeah. that people will have. They'll be like, I'm bloated. When are you bloated? All the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not just bloated after I eat. I'm bloated when I wake up. I'm bloated, you know, after I drink something, I feel bloated. So there's a lot of like fleshing out when somebody comes to you or comes to me with a symptom that we have to like understand what these patterns are. But from a symptom standpoint, it's it's so important for us to really catalog and understand what are all the contributing factors here. Yeah. Um, my husband, Charles, there are times where I'll tell him, slow down, <laughs> because he'll inhale and he'll, he'll eat really quickly too. And then when we pause to think about it, I'm like, all right, let's, let's think about too what that experience is like. Mm-hmm. Should I be? <laughs> eating in front of my laptop, with the emails going, with Slack going, Mm -hmm. plus my phone's dinging, plus the notifications are coming through, then you got social media. Should I be doing like all of these things and maybe even taking a call while I'm chewing (laughs) my food? Yes, yes. You know? So it's like we're, we're not really meant to multitask that way. We're really meant to nourish and savor the nutrients from the food that we eat. And when you chew more and slow things down, those digestive enzymes from the saliva, from preparing the digestive tract are there so that we don't experience symptoms like bloating, Mm -hmm. right? And upset stomach and like, oh, I need to lay down because I ate too fast, (laughs) you know? Yeah. I I think it's also um, something that I want to point out, like living in LA, and this is me coming from more of like that Eastern Chinese medicine perspective because I did grow up in Asia most of my life. In LA, I think we're so primed to thinking that a healthy life is like eat all the salads, drink all the smoothies. But a lot of these salads, like raw vegetables. And I was like, then yeah. that explains why you're so gassy, but because it's so hard to digest. And like in the past, I didn't eat so many salads because like when I came to the States, I was like, like, yeah, I just eat a lot of salads. And like, that's the healthiest way to live. And I think that really exacerbates a lot of people's gut issues because it really is the types of food that you eat as well. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. No, yeah. that's such a good point, which is why, you know, when patients come to Parsley, their health coach is kind of like really talking through, mm-hmm. okay, what are you eating it? What are you eating and when? And what amounts? And is it cooked or is yes. it steamed or yes. is it raw? Um, you know, how well are you cooking your meat if you eat animal products at animal foods? Like there's so many nuances to it. So having somebody kind of like help support you understanding what you eat and when you eat it and why I think there's so much value mm-hmm. to be had there. Mm-hmm. And raw vegetables is one where you're right. A lot of people are like, let me just eat salad three times a day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you, you start to have all these symptoms and you're like, okay, well, why am I having the symptoms? And you have to go back to what you're eating and when you're eating it. Yep. You know? Yep. And then you'll understand, okay, well, what else is in that salad? Is it just like the salad and dressing? Is What's the dressing made out of? Is there a nice healthy fat there? you have some olive oil to it. What about protein? We know protein is crucial. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like what encompasses what you eat and how you eat it? Our bodies were not meant to do 50 things while we eat. Yeah, We're meant to like engage in the connection with the food and how we're nourishing ourselves. And maybe even the conversation if we have somebody that we're, we're sitting down and we're eating that meal with. It wasn't meant to be modern day life. Mm -mm. Checking emails, Slack, phone calls, 
you know, watching something on Netflix all at the same time. I'd love to segue into uh, something that I'm sure most of my female listeners would love to hear more about is what we talked about too, about birth control. Yeah. And period pain. (laughs) We're all still in our (laughs) twenties and we're all getting period cramps. And let's start with, um, with period pain because we all have our stories, you know, it's being so unbearable on certain times. And I remember like, yeah, back when I was a, when I was a teenager, I'd have these period pains out in public where I'd have to physically just like lay down on the ground. Like Mm. I remember one time I was at a shopping mall in Taipei with my family and I came out of the bathroom and I was like, I, I, w- I was trying to be as calm as possible. I didn't want to freak anyone out, but I, I could not walk one more step. I just laid down at the exit of the bathroom. Mm. And this has happened two other times. One time I had to lay down at the lobby of a business office. Mm. And the third time I was watching a movie, Paddington 2, um, with mm. my friend in a movie theater. And it was dark. And I like slowly walked to the bathroom. And I sat in the toilet. I like missed like half of the movie. I sat in the oh. toilet for such a long time. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to go back. And I like crawled myself out onto the, the hallway and I just sat on the carpet for a while. And I was like, oh my gosh, my friend is probably wondering where I'm at. And so I crawled myself back into the cinema oh. and thank goodness it was a reclining chair. And so I just laid down the entire movie. I don't, I didn't even finish. I don't even remember what, what the movie was about, but yeah. when the credits were still rolling, everyone had left and the lights came on. It was just me and my roommate, my, me and my friend. I was just still laying there. And then after that, she went, she wanted to get like a pretzel or something in the food court. And I followed her around. I was like, I was fighting so hard to walk normally. And as oh. she was waiting in line to get a pretzel, I literally just sat down in the middle of the food court, like on the floor. Hmm. And, and that's not normal, but people... I think women, even themselves, they are forced to believe that if you have a cramp, that's normal. But like, tell me what happens when when a cramp happens and yeah. why that shouldn't be seen as like, it's something that we should just deal with. Yeah. So we we often in, in the medical world, we talk about vital signs of health. Mm-hmm. And uh, the fifth and sixth vital signs are period cycles for women who menstruate and pain. Yes. As a vital sign of health. For people who get their menstrual cycle, it is not meant to be excessively painful like that. Yeah. We've normalized (laughs) it. Yeah. You know, like this culture has normalized period pain and being like, oh, yeah, everybody gets it. You know, no big deal. Even though you're the one that's at home doubled over in pain with a heat pack on your belly, kind Mm -hmm. of crawled up into a ball. Pain that is excessive like that is not normal for period cycles. So those symptoms are your body trying to tell you that something's up, something's going on. When women get cramps, that is the experience of the uterus is shedding the lining. Mm -hmm. And as it sheds that lining, there are certain chemicals that are released that elicit the pain. Mm -hmm. We call them prostaglandins. Now, these chemical messengers that elicit this pain, depending on even the levels of hormones or how fast or slow the shedding is of the uterine lining, that is really that whole pain response that happens. Now, there's levels of how people experience it. You'll see, you'll come across women that are like, really? I don't get any of that. I have no symptoms mm-hmm. with my cycles. And then others that are like, ooh, that's me. Every mm-hmm. period cycle, I'm having extreme, excessive pain. Mm-hmm. When the pain is that severe, we absolutely need to be ruling things out anatomically. So talking to your doctor, whether it's your regular doctor, your OBGYN, and saying, look, I'm experiencing excessive extreme pain and I'm noticing that it's happening every single month, Mm -hmm. right before my cycle, for multiple months. Let's make sure that there's not something else going on because they can evaluate to make sure that they're not seeing anything else. Maybe this is an an ovarian cyst that burst that's causing pain, right? Maybe this person has fibroids and they didn't even know it and the inflammatory response of shedding the lining during their menstrual cycle is creating pain. There's many reasons. So talking to a health professional to at least get that lowdown of like, let's make sure that there's nothing severe that's going on. Outside of that, that excessive pain response, there are natural ways to support it. It's not back to that PCOS talk. Oh, you're having a lot of period pain? Let me put you on this drug. Let Mm -hmm. me put you on this birth control or take this medication. So we have to flesh out exactly why and also learn about what are the natural tools that women can use to kind of help support those symptoms. But when we're talking about severe, excessive, too much, doubled over in pain, 
women should not be experiencing that and should be talking to their health care provider about it. Yeah. Because that's not normal. Yeah. You know, there's, there's obviously something more. This is your body telling you there's something wrong. Mm-hmm. In other cases, maybe it's severe fatigue. Maybe it was iron deficiency and they're noticing that they zonk out right before they get their menstrual cycle. Maybe it's irritability and excessive acne or those other types of PMS symptoms. So many women are experiencing PMS symptoms, but they might just chalk it up to that's normal Mm -hmm. when in fact they're like, oh, actually I get that every single month. Mm -hmm. And it should be investigated. It should be looked at so that we can think of thoughtful solutions yeah help balance out the hormones and create more you know less symptoms quick one hi it's melissa from the future so i know that we were talking about period pain in the episode and i just want to draw a bit more focus and attention to that subject because we all have dealt or are currently still dealing with period cramps maybe every single month when your period comes there is a better solution and for me it's something called seed cycling so let me get into it My health coach at Parsley actually was the first person who educated me about seed cycling. And seed cycling is a way of alleviating any of your PMS symptoms that you may have, or it's a way to regulate your periods. As someone with PCOS, I had super irregular periods or one month I would have this insane heavy flow and I would just never know when my period would come and I'd get these awful cramps. That's not normal. But ever since I started seed cycling, I could do not, I cannot go back. I'm a religious seed cycler now. So what is seed cycling, you may ask? It is a method of supporting your hormonal balance by consuming certain seeds. So days one through 14 of your cycle and day one meaning first day of your period, you take one tablespoon of pumpkin seeds and flax seeds. And then days 15 to 28, you take sesame and sunflower seeds. So this is me assuming that a regular cycle is 28 days, but your cycle could be like 30 days, 32 days, it's normal. But the thing is, I'm a little lazy. I don't want to get the pumpkin seeds, the flax seeds, the sesame seeds, the sunflower seeds, and then I put them together. I have to grind them. I just order them from Agni. I can just sprinkle the seeds into breakfast, porridge, chia seeds, yogurt, toast. But I personally just love eating them by the spoonful because it's pretty fun doing that. They sent me a package. Thank you, Agni. This is phase one, the cinnamon maca seasoning. And you have this during days one through 14. And then the latter phase, you have the sesame nori seasoning I know they all sound really delicious but I love it because it's just so convenient it's like already ground up already mixed together their cookies are also delicious this is the double chocolate chip cookie that I always get when I order from them but unfortunately I can't show you what's inside because I already ate all the cookies Sorry. The reason why I'm bringing this brand up is because A, I want you guys to know that there are greener pastures and also B, they're doing a massive warehouse sale right now because they're actually shifting the focus of their company to supporting mothers, which is awesome. But definitely take advantage of this warehouse sale before all of their amazing OG products go out of stock. And if you've been listening till this far, as an added treat, Agni was super gracious at providing us a discount code so you can use the code happy 20 which is h a a p i 20 to get an additional 20 percent off of your order so get all the seasonings get all the cookies get all the teas and i can't wait for you all to try them out and be one step closer to your wellness goals there was a listener who reached out and said that well it's because i have such terrible period cramps that's why she's been on an iud for so long and so that Mm -hmm. kind of transitions to the topic of birth control and iud and i think a lot of women they choose to go on those synthetic hormones is because they really don't want to experience that pain anymore which is fair it can be very painful um but i'd love for you to talk about just the effects of birth control because i also think that a lot of these women they're on it for so long for years and they've just been told to be put on it and they've never really questioned it i was one yeah yeah for <laughs> sure yeah i think that's an unfortunate uh unfortunate reality where there's many generations there's like a few generations of us where you were put on birth control at a young age and you thought you knew why you were put on it Maybe it wasn't really clear why you were put on it. Yeah. Um, Maybe the doctor, your mom sent you to the doctor. They told you to be on it and you're not, you weren't even sure. And then you blink your eyes, 10 years go by and you're in your mid or late twenties and you're still on it. Yeah. And you didn't realize like, okay, I've now been on this for 10, 15 years. Yeah. I was in the boat where I was on it year over year, all the way up until my breast cancer. 
And there is a part of me that does feel like that did play a role in the development of my breast cancer. Mm -hmm. We know that cancer is multifactorial, like many things are. And from the standpoint of, is birth control good or bad? That's not what I'm here to, to say. Mm -hmm. It's very much a personal decision to be on something for a specific reason. Yes. Right? There's also some positives to being on birth control, so we can't vilify it. Yeah. There's also those negatives where I think a lot of women didn't really know about the negatives. Yes. They knew it, it would prevent the pregnancies. They knew that. They knew that it might mitigate their symptoms in the short term, but they didn't know about the long-term consequences. And maybe nobody told them or they just kept renewing that prescription year over year and they just you know, went to the back of their head. Mm -hmm. The common symptoms that women can have over long-term use of birth control Usually, the most common ones that I see patients are nutrients that are depleted in their body. Mm -hmm. It can affect the gut microbiome. Yep. We talked about IVS and yes. lots of symptoms there. So it can affect the digestive tract. It can affect how well those nutrients are absorbed. Mm -hmm. And we also know that it affects hormones. Yeah. It's meant to, because it's meant to kind of stop that signaling between the brain and the ovaries. Yeah. But remember, hormones are meant to work collectively. That means that if this connection or this communication is stopped, there's some imbalances in the way that the brain is able to communicate and connect with other parts of the body from a hormonal perspective, because all the hormones are meant to be doing what they do in their delicate dance at the yeah. same time. Long-term use of birth control. We know that for women that don't detoxify estrogen well, that many of the birth controls are synthetic estrogens. And if your body doesn't detoxify estrogen well, it can build up in the body mm -hmm. and it can build up in tissues. It can, estrogen receptors are also very heavily in the uh, in fat, fatty tissue, so mm -hmm. adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the common side effects that on that side effect label that people throw out whenever they get their next pack of pills? Mood swings, yes. irritability, weight gain. When you hear those things, if your body is depleted from the nutrients that are meant to support mood, like the B vitamins, for example, and it's getting depleted from you being on this birth control, it's no wonder you have mood symptoms because you're depleted of key nutrients that typically help support mood. And that's yeah. just by virtue of being on birth control year over year over long periods of time. Mm -hmm. The estrogen side of things is if you don't detoxify estrogen properly and the body has a perfect storm of that inflammation, that estrogen can create problems. And we know that there's ties to cancer. Yeah. So. From a long-term perspective, I also see in a lot of women that they can have difficulties, not all, but some can have difficulties with getting the period back right away, or maybe they're in their fertility journey and they want to get pregnant, and they got off birth control and it's been a year and they still haven't had a regular rhythmic cycle to help support that pregnancy journey, or maybe they never got their period back after they stopped birth control mm -hmm. and it's been several years. And that can also deplete your bodies, your bones. That can also create problems there. So there's there's lots of kind of nuances yeah. with it where me as a young woman didn't know about all of these things that it could do. I just knew that it was helping to prevent pregnancy. And that was even before I like kind of tapped into the education about maybe it is affecting my gut. Or maybe I am more irritable or my libido is shot down and I don't, <laughs> I don't have zero libido. Mm -hmm. Or I'm noticing, wow. I have gained a lot of weight mm -hmm. and it could likely be that this could be contributing to that. Yeah. Remember I told you I was like, you know, 50 pounds heavier than I am now yeah. at that time. Let's say there's a, there's a woman who's like, okay, like I think I want to transition off of birth control. Mm -hmm. And it's a big step if they've been on it for so many years, mm -hmm. like their mm -hmm. body literally has to like flip a switch and, and, and function in a way that it doesn't depend on birth control anymore. Yeah. What's kind of that, imparting introductory advice you have when someone wants to get off birth control? I see a lot of women for this reason. Yeah. Um, we're living in a time where there's so much information mm -hmm. and the more that women learn about, you know, side effects from long-term use of birth control, they're like making their own decisions mm -hmm. to say, you know what, I'd like to get off. But that fear of what happened, you know, for as far as like the reason why they get on, they got on it in the first place, I remind patients that your body at 16 isn't quite the same you at 26. It's evolved. You've also learned a lot about what we can do to kind of help support detoxification and the gut and sleep 
and stress and being more intuitive about what your symptoms are. So it's not always that when you're, you know, you were on, you were 16 and now you're 26 and you're trying to get off birth control, that you're going to experience all of those same symptoms that you had when you were 16. That's not a guarantee Yeah. when you're 26 and getting off birth control or 36 and getting off birth control. We have this fear mm -hmm. that that's exactly what's going to happen, but that's not always the case and we're not guaranteed to have all of those symptoms again. I think it's important for people to talk to a healthcare provider about it so they can say, I was getting a lot of acne and I was getting um, you know, a lot of really heavy painful periods when I was 16 and that was the reason why I got on birth control. And now I'm 26 and I wanna get off mm -hmm. because that is helpful context for their, for their doctor to understand, okay, well, these were symptoms that they were having then. So as we're focusing on all of the lifestyle things, even some supplementation might be helpful. Maybe this is the types of foods that you're, you're uh, nourishing your body with, the way that you're exercising, how you're handling stress. We can navigate what those changes are gonna look like. For a long time, when your body is on synthetic hormones and that small pulsatile amount like every single day, and then you wake up the brain all of a sudden to start communicating back, people need some support. So educating themselves on how can we can lay down a better foundation for my body going into this will help give you the confidence so that when you do make those decisions to get off, that there are ways to eat to support it. There are foods that are gonna be helpful to detoxify. Yeah. There are There is a way to support your, your exercise at that time period of your life so that this is a nice, easy, smoother transition. And if it's not a, a smooth transition and some of those symptoms that start to come back, then your doctor and you know, okay, now we know what to do about it. So it's not an easy thing to do on your own, especially if you're concerned about those symptoms and you're concerned about not wanting to repeat what happened to you back then. Yeah. But I always encourage women to think that, you know, your body's learned a lot since then. Yeah. And so there's a lot more that can be done at this point when you decide to make that transition. And for a lot of women, they feel that it's a healthy transition to want to get off this medication that they just were on for all these years. And the list of side effects is so many, of which they may not have realized that that was also part of all those things that they're experiencing right now, whether it's IBS and mood swings and irritability and weight gain and poor sleep and decreased libido. The list goes on. Yeah. Just wrapping up on this conversation. We could talk for so long because <laughs> holistic health, like you said, is so loaded. Yeah. There's so many things that we, should, we can talk about. And yeah. I'm trying to make this as all-encompassing as possible, <laughs> as holistic as possible. But um, so someone's like, okay, I, I, I'm I ready to really start listening to my body. And I wanted to make sure that I'm prepping it for longevity, you know, not just, you know, treating the symptom. I really want to get to know my body more in a, in a holistic manner. But it's like, okay, we talked about so much just now, like all the hormones. Like, oh my gosh, it could be, once again, like I said, it can be overwhelming. So if yeah. someone wants to get started in their hormone health journey, like what yeah. are the primary steps that you would recommend they do? Yeah. Do uh, take out a sheet of paper. Yes. And a pencil <laughs> or, you know, notes, whatever it is. Yeah. Don't do anything else. Let's not multitask while we do this one thing. Write down the list of what you're experiencing or what you notice mm -hmm. right now. Put the date. Put down what your symptoms are, okay? Next to it, put down what your goals are. Mm. What is it that you want to accomplish with your health? Is it to get rid of the PMS? Is it to get off the birth control? Is it my mom has diabetes and I don't want to get diabetes yep. and I want to focus on that? Whatever your goals are, make sure that you, you, you put them down on that paper. And when you look at the symptoms and you realize that there's actually a lot of symptoms that you're experiencing, Work with somebody who's going to listen to you Yes, <laughs> to say, let's just not forget about those symptoms and let me just put you on another medication, but let me understand why you have all of these types of symptoms. They're going to need to get to know you. They mm -hmm. want to learn about your body, learn about your habits, learn about your lifestyle. So working with somebody who understands and is going to listen to you and help you reach those goals by understanding all of those symptoms and hearing your whole medical history and your story is crucial to finding the right community, the right support, the right healthcare provider that you really feel comfortable with so that they know ultimately this is what you're trying to accomplish and to achieve. When we look at the symptomatology and we look at the goals, the next thing is to, and it's not always the same for everybody, but think about 
what are some blocks that are creating or that could be contributing to some of the symptoms that you're looking at on your list? Is it my sleep? Mm -hmm. Is it my stress? Is it because I'm doing 10 things while I'm eating and then afterwards I get bloated and gassy? Is it because I'm eating at 10 p.m. at night when my body is trying to sleep? Mm -hmm. Is it because I'm waking up fasted Mm -hmm. (laughs) and starting my day on an empty tank and I'm not nourishing it the way that I should? So starting to develop your own brainstorming list is also helpful too for like, what are some of those contributing factors? And when you put those things together and you see like those lists, it's important to then raise your hand and be like, you know what, maybe I need some help with this. Mm -hmm. I've tried to do what I can for my sleep. I've tried to change my eating habits. None of that seems to be helping me. So it's important to feel really deliberate and informed with what you choose to do when it comes to helping to mitigate those symptoms, learning about your body and understanding why and what you're going to do about it. Yeah. Maybe it's like the exercise, you know, there's, there's so many things Mm -hmm. that could be possibilities. I always tell people to focus on one. Let's start with one goal. Yes. Let's start with reflecting on why that goal is important to you and what symptoms that you have that could be keeping you from getting to that goal. Yeah. And then when you add in labs and you add in a practitioner who's going to help you understand why, and then you add in testing, you know, maybe some people want to do additional special testing. When you add in all of those things, then you can start to really formulate the right plan. It takes a village. Yeah, it does. It's not just going to be like me by myself making these lists and thinking that that's, that's what I need. We all need support, myself included. So we have to surround ourselves with people who are going to help us understand how we can move the needle one Mm -hmm. step at a time, not feel dismissed, not feel like you go to the doctor and you come back to the car and you're like traumatized from that experience thinking, what the heck just happened? She just said exercise and sleep, but she didn't tell me more than that. I didn't Mm -hmm. understand why Mm -hmm. I needed to do that. Because I, over the past two years, do have have taken my health a bit more seriously now, I do have like a, a dedicated health journal, which people might find excessive, but I feel like over the years I've become much more in tune with my body, which I think is also a skill that people need to to sharpen because I think a lot of people are like, okay, I want to listen to my body, but it's not speaking to me. And I feel like that was the case for me when I started. And I was like, I don't know, like I feel fine, but it was when I, you know, got this, you know, more information and I was able to like get lab work done and see, you know, specific, like what, what exactly is happening in my body that now it's like, I'll write, if I feel a certain way on a certain day or if like my period feels this way on a certain day, I like jot it down. So the next time, you know, I meet with, you know, Dr. Bentley or with you in the future, it's like I can bring up those concerns and, you know, I have that support to my listeners who are kind of disenfranchised by our healthcare system. There are greener pastures, you know, it's like (laughs) you just have to know where to look. And so hopefully this kind of puts a crack in the door on a new opportunity out there. If you want to look more into advancing your health and not just, a purely Western way, but, you know, looking at the full picture, which is what we've been talking about this entire time. Um, This has been such a lovely conversation, (laughs) honestly, like every time, you know, I'm just always learning more and more. And it's such a a privilege to have you on the show. Um, Thank you. I I feel like happy to be here. I feel like you're going to write a book one day. Are you? (laughs) (laughs) It's funny that you you mentioned that I've been asked that many, many times. Yes. Um, (laughs) It's been brewing in my heart for a Mm -hmm. while. Um, I can see myself writing something sooner rather than later, but it's certainly on the horizon because I feel like I have so much more to offer outside of seeing patients one-on-one and so on. So thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tolentino. I hope people can visit you on your Instagram and maybe one day they'll get a visit with you at Horsley. Maybe. (laughs) Thanks so much for coming on the show. Of course.